artist must organize his life. Here is the exact timetable of my daily activities. Get up, 7.18 a.m. Be inspired, 10.23 to 11.47 a.m. I take lunch at 12.11 and leave the table at 12.14. More inspiration, 3.12 to 4.07. My doctor has always told me to smoke. Part of his advice runs, smoke away, my dear chap. If you don't, someone else will. He uh, is a, a very surprising character to come about at the time that he did and at any time to have had his perceptions and to have uh, the kind of comments he made to see the world the way he saw it, uh, you just wonder where the, did this come from? I mean, this is the world of um, middle to late 19th century European romanticism with Mahler and Brahms and the whole load, Bruckner, there are all these, you know, self-important characters running around writing enormous symphonies and here's this Here's this jackass in Paris who's just turned everything on his head. I think lots of artists uh, of my generation got influenced by Sati because he represented marginal people and one wanted to try very hard to do something that was different, um, at least I did. And uh, Sati was a, a nice kind of model for that, that you could plod on, you could ignore all these uh, things that were making money or big success or names for people, and you could uh, explore your little margins. And I, I think uh, Derrida, another wacky Frenchman, hit it on the nose when he said the margins are at the center. And it's people like Sati prove that. <laughs> In the 1870s, the Cadbury brothers set up shop in Bourneville. There were many other makers of chocolate, but the Cadburys had to do it differently. Not bad. Dismissed by Pierre Boulez as a little inventor, but called indispensable by John Cage, Satie has often been reduced to the composer of a single piece the Gymnopédie number one. It's a very pure melody. It is this beautiful, simple harmonies that you have only this change. And building up this mel melancholical uh, rhythm on these two chords. And um, I think the quality of the melody is very special. He had a very clear mel melodic gift. If you take the gymnopodies as a set of three, what you get is a rather modern technique of looking at the same object but from different angles, which is something that contemporary composers are interested in doing. They're not necessarily interested with developing material, which is a 19th century technique. Um, the first gymnopathy, which of course is the almost hackneyed one, the one that everybody knows, I think it's interesting how it has retained its purity despite being used for commercials and all kinds of things. I mean, being dragged into a commercial world. Have you noticed, when you don't feel well, you always go to the one you know? The simplest tunes have that quality, that you can al you're can almost making it up with the piece. And of course, the gymnopodies are very simple. I mean, they're basically binary form, with a little kick at the end. Like the first gymnopody, it suddenly goes minor at the end, which you're not expecting. And that's what gives it a little, a little kind of lemon tang to it.
the question about w whether we can survive the commercialization of these works, uh, it's really not the music that's going to survive. It's, it's, it's our ability to hear it that is, that's at stake. The music's fine. I mean, in 50 years or 100 years, if someone rediscovers that music, it'll still be just as good. I mean, it, the question is, uh, what's been eroded is our ability to perceive it uh, in, 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 in its own terms. And when that music kind of music is commercialized, uh, it doesn't destroy the music, it destroys us. Towards the end of his life, Satie invented a new kind of music. He called it furniture music. Satie wanted music d'ameublement to be useful, like heat, light, or an armchair. Furniture music challenged received ideas, just as Satie did himself. Nobody could, could I think, avoid to be uh, impressed by, by Satie. In fact, if one didn't have the opportunity to meet him often, he gives the impression to be a man who, a clerk in fact, and a very serious clerk, who would attend his office with a great regularity, absolutely decently dressed, in the most bourgeois manner. And sometimes you wondered is he acting or isn't he? I think the most important thing about Satie's life is that he was probably uh, the purest artist that I can think of. Uh, that his, he lived entirely for his art, for his music. got uh, acquainted with it, the more I loved the music. Not all of it, you know. Sometimes I liked the cabaret things, sometimes I liked the early uh, dance gothique. Uh, and I always thought that uh, the unity of the man and the music uh, was very, was a guideline really for me. One of the cultural high points of 1924 was a new ballet designed by the painter Picabia with music by Satie. Relâche was high art, but it flaunted the gestures and melodies of the street. Satie and Picabia called Relâche an instantaneous ballet. Eric Satie is a contemporary. He's someone who has mis one of the first pieces of the art contemporary as I love it. Pourquoi on pense souvent que l'art contemporain doit détruire quelque chose Je pense, moi, qu'il y a un équilibre entre la destruction et la construction. Il faut construire après avoir détruit quelque chose, construire quelque chose sur les débris des choses qu'on a détruites.
ne peut pas parler chez Satie d'art populaire uniquement. Il y a des choses qui sont... Il y a des airs de la rue, donc qui nous ramènent à l'art populaire, mais cet art populaire est regardé par les yeux d'un intellectuel, de quelqu'un qui aime l'ironie, qui aime aussi les choses très très sérieuses, qui aime la métaphore, qui aime l'allusion et qui aime surtout le deuxième degré. Rien n'est simple chez Satie et rien n'est simple dans la danse que j'ai fait. strange description by Debussy, who was no slouch with words at all, who called him a gentle medieval musician. I think he's using very, two very precise terms, isn't he? Gentle in the Chaucerian sense, like a very perfect gentle knight, someone who uh, includes manners in their work. I mean, there's a kind of uh, restraint in Satie's work that's good manners, I think, despite the ex eccentric titles and all the silly stories. This is, a, uh, mu this is music of courtesy courtesy to the audience is not giving anything to the audience that they don't need it's paired away and he's done the work for them rest in peace. As for me, I was born in Honfleur in the Pont l'Evêque district on the 17th of May 1866. Honfleur is a small town watered by the poetic waves of the Seine and, in complicity, the tumultuous ones of the Channel. Its inhabitants are very polite and very agreeable. I remained in the city until I was 12. I became a rather ordinary young man, tolerable, but no more. At that time in my life, I began to think and to write music. Wretched idea. Very wretched idea.
For the American composer John Cage, Vexations was an essential musical work. Cage said yes, he believed, he firmly believed that Satie meant for this piece to be played, and that's what was interesting. Cage was never an ivory tower composer. Everything he ever wrote was to be played. It was usually written for a specific occasion, and he was, um, he was very, very pragmatic. And to him, it would be of no interest to think of the idea, just of an idea of a piece, of a conceptual piece. To him, the interest is in actually doing it, in the discipline of doing it, and what you, what you learn in the process of doing it. He discovered Satie when he was quite young and had just left college and went to Paris. And in his searches, he came across Satie's notebooks and found in the notebooks columns of numbers, just simply columns of numbers. And that was at a time when he he was writing pieces by first coming up with columns of numbers and creating rhythmic structures and different kinds of structures. And that pleased him no end to find, to find those notebooks. Satie was, the, was one composer, you know, for whom, uh, who was a lifelong friend to Cage. Everyone will tell you that I am not a musician. That is correct. From the very beginning, I classed myself as a phonomatographer Science is the dominating factor. Besides, I enjoy measuring a sound much more than hearing it. With my phonometer in hand, I work happily and with confidence. What haven't I weighed or measured? I've done all Beethoven, all Verdi, etc. It's fascinating. On my phono scales, a common or garden F sharp registered 93 kilos. It came out of a fat tenor, whom I also weighed. At the Paris Conservatoire, Satie was not a success. One teacher reported, worthless. Three months just to learn a piece. But Satie was a diligent student of sounds closer to his heart, especially the music of the Middle Ages. Satie's notebooks show that he came day after day to the Bibliothèque Nationale. Here he would spend hours studying plain chant and the occult. I think that there have been many attempts to divide Satie's career up into several different phases. And my view of Satie's work is that uh, it's actually one phase um, and that he was basically doing the same thing the whole time. There's no doubt that he became interested in certain areas of hermetic texts, typical of the kind of fin de siècle mysticism that was around at that time. And I think what he was doing came out of his work here at the Bibliothèque Nationale and this whole period in the 1890s, which is not to say that he was always creating mystical works, but that somehow he, he discovered a way of approaching um, life and art at that time, which he then adhered to pretty rigidly for the rest of his life. Um, even though his musical style changed. The Gothic cathedrals were constructed over many centuries by many hands, all of them anonymous but great artists who had a different function to play in each aspect of each cathedral. And I think that Satie's work covers all areas of art, not just music. He wrote texts, he used visual imagery, calligraphy and many other aspects. And uh, in some sense, there's, a, there's an echo of the Gothic idea there of many different art forms combining.
was taken up with alchemy. One day I was having a rest, alone in my laboratory. Outside the sky was leaden, livid and sinister, really ghastly. I was feeling sad without knowing why. Into my head came the idea of amusing myself by counting on my fingers slowly from one to 260,000. This I did, and very boring it was too. A uh, work, for example, like Vexation, Vexations, is the subtitle of an important work by Paracelsus, a noted alchemist and herbalist. And in that text, one finds an instruction to the would-be alchemist that anything that goes wrong with the alchemical process is not the fault of the process itself. It's the lack of skill of the would-be alchemist that's at fault. And this reminds one very much of Satie's instructions for performing vexations. Vexations poses a kind of philosophical problem. What he does is to write this piece of music and then to add the instruction. But the instruction says what would happen if you were to play this 840 times. I'd say in order to play this piece 840 times, you'd have to prepare yourself in advance and be in such and such a condition. And I guess the only way of testing whether you were in that condition is to play 840 times. Otherwise, it's entirely hypothetical. In performing vexations, you experience uh, a, a, um, a very long duration of time. Uh, you also experience uh, repetition within time and therefore there is the possibility of boredom. But if you survive vexations, then um, you've gone beyond boredom. It's rather like sort of achieving enlightenment in, in Zen Buddhism, that uh, you can no longer be bored. It's no use trying to understand sati from outside. Uh, judging from, uh, looking from all these different angles uh, that are possible. The important thing is that you love him enough and try to get his view of reality. And so, to speak, you can see through his eyes. In 1887, Satie left home and became a resident of Montmartre. He frequented cabarets like Chat Noir and Auberge du Clou. Satie soon adopted a bohemian lifestyle and a dandified appearance to go with it. To escape creditors, Satie moved to a small room in the Rue Cordeau, number six. Yeah, Eric Satie lived here in the 90s, 100 years ago, really. He founded this church here and uh, he had his own little love affair which probably only lasted three or four weeks 
And I think he liked to live here because he was near his painter friends. It's always very moving to come here uh, because you uh, try to understand the man who lived a very enigmatic, stylized life. forget when we begin to describe Satin that he drank a lot and that sometimes a man who drinks too much is not absolutely himself. You had to be cautious with him? You couldn't. No? Absolutely not. Because sometimes uh, the most normal thing would uh, irritate him, you didn't know why. Uh -huh. Like, uh, do you remember anything uh, normal that irritated him? If he suddenly says, mettez-moi ce bout de papier en crypte, if you understand what it means, I will be delighted. So you try to put that piece of paper like this, or like this, or like this, mm -hmm. and it does not, it is not what he, it doesn't express at all what he wants. Mm -hmm. So every time you put it in a certain manner, he becomes a little more furious. <laughs> <laughs> Until you manage to put it in the most normal and stupid manner, he says, that's it. Thank you very much, it's all. <laughs> That's because he had his own logic. And there were many things of that type. He was not out speaking to terms with his brother. And why? Because he attended the funerals of his sister-in-law they lived far from Paris. And after the funeral, uh, he said to his brother, let's go and have a drink. And Conrad answered, I, I don't feel like going to a cafe now. Sati said, why, I'm coming from Paris for you, and you don't want to come with me. In 1892, Satie composed one of his strangest, most enigmatic works. Even its title, Usput, the name of its hero, remains an unsolved mystery. Usput, acte premier. Une plage déserte. Au milieu, une statue. Au loin, la mer. Usput. After a disastrous tryout at L'Auberge du Clou, Satie boasted that he would get Usput staged at the Paris Opera. December 1892. Eric Satie to Monsieur Bertrand, director of the Théâtre National de l'Opéra. The benevolence which, in spite of everything, I feel towards you impels me to accord you a further and final delay of one week. Once this period is passed, I shall regretfully have to address to the minister the expression of my just indignation and to send two of my friends to call upon you to account for your conduct. Usput, détonné, prend du sable et s'en frotte les yeux. Sonnerie de trompette, défilé aérien des martyrs qui maudissent Usput, Uspud ramasse des pierres et les jette à l'église chrétienne. Les pierres se changent en globes de feu. Fureur d'Uspud Il prend une pierre 
plus grosse, qui éclate avec fracas, des flammes surgissent et de leur sein s'échappent des étoiles, grande convulsion de la nature. Eric Satie to Ernest Legrand, Paris, the 18th of the month of December, 1892. My dear and venerable master, Bertrand received me yesterday. This leads me to believe in the early performance of Uspud at the opera in the winter of 1927, or at the very latest, that of 1943. I think that he was interested in, in, in time and in duration, but not in the extreme extended time that we're talking about in the late 20th century. He, he basically unloaded functional harmony totally. The kinds of harmonic structures that, 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 uh, that take you from place to place in a completely recognizable way. Uh, when, you say, when we say that Sati was uh, interested in uh, uh, a different kind of time, I, I think you can might easily say he was interested in a different kind of place. Uh, that, that when you think of the music in that way, uh, uh, the thing that's interesting about the piano pieces is that they don't go anywhere. And just the, that expression, when we say, we often talk about music going places, the reason I'm talking about places is because it, it becomes, it's a common way that we talk about music. Music goes somewhere or it doesn't. Often Sati's music doesn't go, or it goes, it, 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 or it goes in a circular way. Poverty forced Satie to leave Montmartre for the obscure Paris suburb of Arcueil Cachon. He rented a cheap room in the Rue Cauchy, where he was to live for the rest of his life. Looks much nicer on a sunny day. My poor Tibi, I am ruined. The wheel of fortune is no longer in my grasp. It is destitution. It would be very kind if you would send me a little help in the shape of a money order without which I shall be exposed to cruel suffering. Sadeki, Sadeki, Lum Zumbulu, Mon Koma Vimba, Bonga, Said Sherry. At some point, uh, he felt that Montmartre was no longer good for him, and he needed another environment. So he came out with his friends, Contamine de la Tour and uh, Grasmic, the painter, to look at the apartment that uh, a clochard, Bibi la Purée, had just left. And he took it and moved in. This was a time of seclusion for him, really. I am very glad to be in Arcueil. The environs, including Gentilly, are so sad, so tearful, that it moves me. 
and is as agreeable to me as a badly dressed, pale and pretty wolf, the good one. Death, our little sister, the one you talk about with such joy, must love these suburbs, all so filled with herself. At each step, you see, you meet phantoms assuming a human or animal appearance, no doubt in order to be more funny. Monsieur Sati était un ami de mon père. Et mon père s'occupait du patronage laïque à Arcueil, Cachan. Et, et Monsieur Sati avait désiré le, le, en faire partie. Il s'occupait d'ailleurs de garder les enfants. Il faisait des théories sur les, la musique et sur les sons. Et entre autres, il, euh, avec sa canne, il tapait sur les gouttières pour faire différents sons et, et donner une explication. Si bien que euh, il arrivait que ça durait trop longtemps, et ça se passait ça à 11 heures au minuit, et les locataires euh, se mettaient à la fenêtre et ils leur demandaient de se taire. Et au besoin, et, ils avaient un vase et puis le, ils, le, ils le renversaient par la fenêtre. These were difficult and unproductive years for Satie. He put aside the 12 velvet suits he had worn since the 1880s and took on the appearance of a bourgeois functionary. And despairing of his musical gifts, Satie enrolled at the Schola Cantorum. It's an extraordinary thing, really, because at that time, Satie was, what, 39 years old? And the idea of what we call now continuing education just didn't exist then. Um, and at the age of 39, he decided to study, and in fact, to study counterpoint. And it was in a period when Sati wrote almost no music as well. So it's a kind of critical time in his life. And um, anyone who goes through a kind of fallow patch is sort of interested in other people who go through that. It's something which a number of composers have done. Um, apparently Schubert, just at the end of his life, decided to study counterpoint. They all seem to go back to the same thing, studying 16th century counterpoint. The notebooks show uh, that he was an extremely diligent student and, and did it very well. In fact, he probably uh, sort of overdid it. And maybe it's a kind of mark of mature students that they, they go for overkill. Um, the, 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 the notebooks are incredibly neat and you wrote out the fugues in different coloured ink so you can actually see what's going on. And. Um, that sort of uh, care and uh, incredible attention to detail is something which you find in Satie's music too. start to compose and then you look about how other people compose, um, those people who've in a sense struggled with composition become very useful models and Satie was someone who did struggle um, or whose struggles are visible a lot of the time. It doesn't mean that the results are painful or uh, uh, inadequate, it means that there is, you can see often the way in which he arrived at his decisions. He's almost a kind of timeless figure. That's what makes Satie rather hard to place historically because uh, he could exist in almost any period. Uh, he could exist now, he could have existed in the medieval period, he could exist in sort of uh, 18th century Japan, uh, he could exist in North India. Um, as a kind of, that sort of slightly otherworldly, slightly saintly, alcoholic kind of figure.
I'm dying of boredom. Everything I begin timidly fails with a certainty that I've never known before till now. What can I do but turn towards God and point the finger at him? I end up thinking the old man is even more stupid than powerful. I'm beginning to believe that the good Lord is a dirty old man. His supposed mercy. I can see he hides it somewhere and draws it out very rarely. If the dead go fast, money, which is no more stupid than anything else, goes equally fast. And it's a pleasure to see it walk ahead without looking round and as proud as punch as it goes. une référence, c'est un maître, il fait partie de ma vie, des gens avec qui on dort, on rêve, on se promène, je dirais que c'est un, oui c'est une référence, quand je fais quelque chose, quand je suis ému, quand je suis triste, quand je suis gay, je me dis tiens, comment aurait été M. Satsi, il me surprend là. J'aurais fait comme ça. Puis des fois, non. Des fois, non. Mais profondément, oui. Oui, il fait partie de... Il est à côté de moi. On marche toujours ensemble. Je, je le suis, je, je le vis. À Arcueil, dans ce lieu, bien évidemment. À Honfleur. À Honfleur, cette ville aussi si belle, mais si mélancolique, si, si bizarre, si étrange. Honfleur. À Montmartre. Ces villes de collines. Trois collines dans la vie de cette vie. came to Paris to gather material for a collage portrait of Satie. You're going to give me some material about That's Eric right. Satie, because I'm right. doing this collage. I found some... No, I hope you've got some rotten things for me. Really bad, you know? Very bad? What do you call Bad things? Not too new. Well, I know. I, well, I always find when I'm trying to work. Yes, so that's much better true to work us. Poor materials. That's very poor material, that's very that's ordinary ones. It's horrible, yes, it's excellent. This is... Uh, RK station, railway station. These are almost bad enough for me. Oh yeah, that's a very good one, with uh, Hotel de Ville. Now, can I have these? I mean, if they oh, yeah, never sure. return. Sure, yeah, I took it for you. Because uh, sometimes I destroy things. Never mind. I like tabac, because Sati was a smoker. Oh yes, and he drank a lot too. Yeah. yeah. I wonder why an English painter gets so much interested with by Eric Satie. I don't know. Though, I'm, it's so much that particular person. It's just the kind of person that he represents to me, and that's honest people. People who are honest get into trouble. I think they can't. You know, if an artist is really honest and absolutely true in every way and can't do anything poor or shabby, then in the end he only uh, must become a madman because life isn't built for honest people. I think uh, Sati was one of those people who had to hide, hide behind jokes. Yeah, because actually he was very serious, you know, tragic, damaged, uh, frightened figure, you know, surrounded by all these liars and uh, prevaricators. And there he was, wanted to do something very simple and very naked. And that's why, you know, if you know, if you write naked music, that's the most difficult of all to write. You write music you can just see through, like a piece of glass. Sure. Do you know Sparrow et Divertissement, which is a beautiful yes, book? Yes, I did, and with the nice, it's, it's an incredible edition. Yes, yeah, that the original edition. But it was the proposition of the publisher. Uh, yes, Stravinsky to do a book with a painter. And Stravinsky said, all right, but I want, I don't remember exactly, yeah. but a certain sum of money. And the publisher was a young man and said, well, I can't, it's impossible, it's too expensive. Uh, but I'd, I'd like to have this sort of collaboration between a painter and a musician. Mm. And Savinsky said, but why don't you ask Eric Satie? He will suddenly do it. So the publisher went to Eric Satie and proposed the same thing. And a certain amount of money, 
and Sati suddenly jumped and said, well, it's too much money. I accept to do it, but for less money. When I got back from Paris with these postcards, I thought, well, the best thing is to use this uh, hard-won postcard, first of all, in case I don't use it at all, and then it would seem a vain, glorious trip. So it seemed a very good idea to uh, position Sati in Arcueil Cachon, so I used one of those cards, and I used the one uh, with a tobacconist in it. There's a kind of alleyway at the bottom that seems to be going nowhere down which the Chaplinesque figure of Sati could eventually recede. But one feels a need to put an image of Sati in it because uh, he did have this image of himself. You could get a, a Sati kit, really, couldn't you, with the bowler hat and the pince nez and the cigarette and the corduroy suit and the umbrella. So I feel if you get these elements, then you have the portrait that he made, in fact, the portrait that he hid behind. I don't know if anybody knew Sati. Uh, I, this, this is the thing that doesn't come out to me from various things I've read about people knowing things. And I don't suppose I can make him more knowable by doing things. But, uh, no, he's a hider. Shortly after finishing at the Schola Cantorum, Sati found that his early music was being rediscovered, but he strongly resisted making any changes in his way of life. You know, when Satie had a little money, he invited us for lunch in a very good restaurant, for instance. And when we arrived, uh, he was there already since an hour or two, working, composing, and little books. And he had next to him what uh, we have in those type of restaurants, uh, those little plates. That means that every time you drank a glass of beer, you brought you a little plate, and finally there was a pile of plates. He, 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 when he came here, he drank his coffee, and as he was from Normandy, they usually like to put a little brandy or in the coffee. And I must say that half of a bottle or three quarters of a bottle uh, disappeared. And the trouble is, is when he left us in the afternoon, he walked perfectly straight. At a table. Personally, the culinary art has always filled me with great admiration, an admiration which has never been mitigated. For me, eating is a duty, a pleasant holiday duty, of course, and I absolutely mean to fulfill this duty with great precision and careful attention. I am endowed with a good appetite and eat on my own account, with no egoism, no bestiality. In other words, I keep my place better at table than on a horse, even though I'm a pretty good rider. At meals, my role has its importance. I am a guest. Just as in a theater, others are spectators. Yes, the spectator has a definite part to play. He listens and he sees. The guest, for his part, eats and drinks. All in all, it's the same thing. Virtuosic dishes, carefully calculated with subtle knowledge, are not the ones which attract my attention as a taster. In art, I like simplicity. The same goes for cooking. I'm much more likely to applaud a well-cooked leg of mutton than some subtle concoction of meat disguised beneath the learned makeup of a master of sauce.
he's obviously reacting against romantic piano literature, which was extremely virtuoso and always showed the performer off and also showed off their emotions in a rather blatant way. He does a spoof of Chopin's funeral march, um, which would be normally... And he turns it into... It has the same kind of heavy tread, and in the middle section, he does a spoof of... Chopin's uh, trio theme, but he does it in completely the wrong key. Instead of B flat minor, he does it in C. And makes it, instead of going, which is what the tune would do, he makes it very banal, deliberately, because I think he thought that this was rather banal music. You just think you've got one portrait of him and in fact um, it's completely the wrong one or it doesn't actually hold all the details. Um, you know, he was on the fringes of society, he chose that position, nonetheless he got very upset when he got bad reviews. He pretended that he didn't want any of the uh, um, honours that Ravel took, for example, and yet he was rather touched when he was older that he had some followers, you know, clearly this rather pleased him. Um, so he was susceptible like anybody. And I think he could see very clearly the, um, the trouble that if you became a very uh, successful composer and part of the establishment, how that could affect your work and how indeed it always does affect composers and how, how it, it kind of gets rid of all the radical elements in their music. And it's quite interesting that he didn't stop being radical. In 1917, Satie collaborated with Jean Cocteau and Pablo Picasso to create a ballet that became one of the great artistic scandals of wartime France. Apollinaire invented a new critical term to describe it, super-realist. Satie's music was strongly influenced by jazz. This is the most influenced by Eric Satie that I've ever gotten. Although, in a way, he influences me in non-musical ways. Like, I also eat breakfast at exactly 9.17. Or 13 and my father was a piano teacher but I was pretty culturally deprived but we did have a radio and I turned on the radio and I had a wire recorder and I recorded the first thing I heard and it was Parade by Eric Satie and then the tape the wire recorder broke so that was the only piece I owned it was magical to me it was evocative of different kinds of people that didn't have anything to do with with hot fudge sundaes and hot dogs and roller skating rinks and that was my world up until then and all of a sudden my my spirit was able to fly away to the foreign lands I forgot about Eric Satie for eight years and didn't hear him again until Charlie Hayden came up to me one day and said you gotta hear this piece and it was the gymnopathies and I heard that I said, it's great. I went out and bought it. Well, actually, I stole it from a musical uh, library. I still have it. It's all 
yellowed and dog-eared. And I played it. And the thing I liked was it was easy. I could play it. I couldn't play all the other music I liked. But I could play this. It was so simple and also beautiful. Simple and beautiful. Ameublement, uh, furniture music, uh, was invented by Satie in 1920. He wanted uh, to contribute to interior decorating. He wanted it to blend with the environment, something, a refined musical environment, which uh, goes with tables, spoons, and uh, crockery, whatever. But listen, we have it all the time, that music d'ameublement. We could kill it, because we hear music all the time in supermarkets, in uh, elevators. Where don't we hear music? Such he would be probably fed up, actually. At that moment, it was not successful at all, because as soon as that music began, the people stopped walking, and they began to listen, so it didn't work. Eric Satie to Valentine Gross, Arcoy Cachan, 18th January 1917. What am I doing? I'm working on the life of Socrates. Plato is a perfect collaborator, very gentle and never troublesome. It's a dream. I'm swimming in happiness. At last I'm free, free as air, as water, as the wild sheep. Long live Plato. I'm free. I'm very free. When he came across the possibility of using Plato uh, uh, for, co for composition, it was a very unusual decision because it's a prose work. It hasn't got a kind of French poetic uh, tradition behind it. But he got very excited because here was a, a man writing about honesty, a man writing about clarity of purpose, a man writing about a person. And Plato's writing, of course, about Socrates in a very particular sense. Socrates is not a beautiful man. He's an argumentative, a difficult, a cornered, a marginalized man in many ways, and a teaching man, a man who's uh, doing things so that it should be clear what he's up to. It's a radical composition. That means that uh, he limits very strongly the material on all levels. That means on all the different parameters music has. And it's extremely uh, straight ahead in the same limitations but not simply dull no it's extremely dense and f profound in the way he handles this limited material <laughs> disturbed by any false note in it strangely enough there's no rhetoric there's no showing off there's none of the no uh, rumbustious uh, musical elements there's nothing extra you're just moving through a text and I think uh, Sati was overjoyed to find a, a text that you could just go through and come out to the other end and he'd been perfectly accompanied and had accompanied it perfectly in doing so it's an amazing feat cliches all the time and it's not nothing is more easy than when it's going 
to to have this text about the guy is going to die to uh, exploit uh, ban banalities vulgar uh, sentimentalities whatever you can imagine that's what a lot of people do all the time composers also and why the piece is a masterpiece is that you hear this continuously avoiding clichés or vulgarities or banalities which would be have been very easy with this subject I thought I was composing a simple work without the least idea of conflict. When performed at our conservatoire, my music was badly received, which didn't surprise me. But I was surprised to hear the audience laugh at Plato's text. Yes, strange, isn't it? People seem to believe that the great Socrates was a character invented by me. And this is Paris. idea of Socrates opening up and pouring out of him all the aspects of Satie's life sounded easy didn't it and I started with some background of Satie and where he was and there are already an amazing number of things in this very modest tiny picture not that that's a virtue of the picture it's probably a, a fault it's a glass of wine and there's some cryptic lettering and there's a hand making a shadow graph black cat, as in the Chat Noir. And, and just to put that final piece on, I took the bit of the matchbook from the Closerie de And, uh, of course, as one opens up the box of one's associations with Satin, in order to put the things together to make this object, and one relives all that music, and one relives the memories of his writings, and the knowledge of what an extraordinary model human being he was. In 1924, Satie embarked on a collaboration with the painter Picabia. Roulache was a ballet that mocked the world of high art and was the last great expression of Dadaist high spirits. At the age of 58, Satie seems to have found the perfect subject. For me, it was very important to come back to Satie. Cage was for me a beautiful example of Dadaism, and this was the dream of my youth. I was enchanted by Dadaism, and uh, Cage somehow gave me an opportunity to get back to that through the Fluxus movement, I think. And then, only then, I discovered that uh, Satie was a Dadaist musician, even the only one. And uh, he did this ready-made with Man Ray, the Fair Repassé, in an iron where, where they put nails on the ironing side. The Entracte was a film by René Clair called Entracte. The music Satie wrote for Clair's film was to be his last.
had the feeling that he was weak and that uh, it couldn't go on forever to going back to 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 Arcueil. That's the reason why we tried to. to we had a, Jean Vienner managed to have a room for him in the hotel, extremely comfortable. He had never seen a doctor in his life. He had never taken his temperature. So that was an awful, uh, the most complicated thing to take the, the temperature, to, to shake it. He was afraid you would break it. He hated that room. And so he sat, he stayed all day sitting in an armchair opposite the cupboard with a great mirror. Therefore, he was watching himself all day. And he had attached uh, some strings to the, you say, call that the knob of the door, in order to be able to open the door without moving. He attached those strings to his armchair. And he stayed there, stirring the whole day, until he vanished. <laughs> in the Hotel Istria, he chose, because it was his taste and he felt much better than in the Grand Hotel, where, he, in fact, he was horribly unhappy. Later, Satie was moved to the Hôpital Saint-Joseph. So I packed up his suitcase, and that was quite a story, because I was terrified. First of all, I don't... For me, a suitcase is something uh, I don't... I mean, I've never been able to fold anything decently, and especially not for set. But Brack, the painter, was very tall, and I asked him to stand between the, the bed, Satie's bed, and myself. Thanks to that, I could put everything in his suitcase and bring them over. was very sick and therefore we were absent longer than we had expected. So when I came back to Paris, uh, the f I went to see Satie immediately and I must say he was uh, in an extremely sad condition and I said to Darius, you have to go tomorrow, but the following day the, the room was uh, already empty. Satie had died uh, during the night. We fell. 